We come to this catechism answer, question and answer on the doctrine of creation, which will roll over into question 10, what did our, how did God create man? We reach just this point. The doctrine of creation is here being asserted, it's here being taught and laid out for us in a very basic but helpful way, as you'll see as we go through. What we find in the scriptures, of course, is that God stands at the beginning of scripture. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God. It's an assertion, it's a declaration, it's a proclamation. God's declaring who he is, that in the beginning he was already there. The beginning, of course, is the beginning of time, the beginning of all temporal things, the beginning of history, the beginning of creation. At that beginning, God was already, for he was eternally there. Indeed, he is the eternal one. There is no one else. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. He shares his glory with no one. He alone is the Lord. The Lord is before all things. He has always been. And according to Colossians 1.17, He is the creator of all things. And Colossians 1.17 reminds us that all things are not just the visible things that we see, but also the invisible things that we do not see. All things visible and invisible. So there's no eternal spirit. There's no eternal entity or being that is incapable of of our beholding with our eyes that God did not create, that is also eternal. Nothing is eternal but God, and he created all things. He is the origin of all things, and all things belong to him and are subject to him. This truth, this truth of origins, this truth of God being the creator, everything being subject to him, this is the foundation of all knowledge. We know what we know because God is, and because God has declared what is and what is to be known unto us. Particularly, he has declared himself, because creation, Psalm 19 tells us, is a revelation of God. But we, that's why we call creation general revelation, as opposed to supernatural or special revelation from the word of God. So God has declared, we only know what we know, and all that we know, we know from God, because he has opened his mouth and made these things known through general and special revelation. So this truth is the foundation of all knowledge. Burkhoff says... Echoing that, this is the beginning and the basis of all revelation and also the foundation of all ethical and religious life. What does he mean by that? I'll highlight four things here for you. First of all, that God is. That God is is the beginning and the basis of all knowledge and all worship, the religious life. That God is and that he is the eternal self-existent one, the sovereign. Secondly, that God is the creator of all things. He is the beginning of all things. His being alone is eternal. Everything else is derivative, derived from him. Thirdly, that God and his will can be known through his revelation. Right? God is transcendent. He transcends God as holy other, and yet he can be known. He cannot be known exhaustively, but he can, know, he can be known truly because what he has created is a revelation, Psalm 19 says, of his glory. And Romans 1 echoes that. Enough, of course, to condemn, as we'll find out in a moment. So that God and his will can be known through his revelation. And fourthly, that it's therefore the bounden duty of all creation to worship, love, and obey God. Those four things are bound up, I think, um, in Burkhoff's little statement there, but basically those four things are the foundation of all knowledge and the ethical and religious life. Van Dixorn, who will be next year's conference speaker, says, although this creation does not provide the good news of the gospel, it does provide us with material for preaching repentance to those who ignore God's testimony and for defending the faith against those who deny his existence. Creation again, says Burkhoff, is that work of God by which he produces the world and all that is in it, partly without the use of pre-existent materials and partly out of created material that is by its nature unfit for the manifestation of his glory. Creation is, says Alexander White, the divine act of bringing all things beyond the divine nature, all things visible and invisible, into existence. That's what creation is. Now notice Burkhoff's definition. Burkhoff says that creation is partly the work of God making some things out of nothing and then other things out of pre-existent material unfit for his glory. The distinction that he's making there, the distinction made in Genesis 1, the Reformed 
Reformed theologians make, the distinction between God making the heaven and the earth, and we find in in Genesis 1 that the earth was made, and we're, we're told that it was formless and void. And then God takes that mass, which seems to be a mass of water, he takes that mass and he begins to separate. So the first three days of creation are the separation of things and the creating of realms, if you will. And then the next three days are creating and establishing rulers to take dominion over those realms and giving, of course, man dominion over all the realms, right? As God's vicegerent in earth. And so that's what he means. It's very important, as our catechism answer declares, that God made all things out of nothing. And he did. But out of that pre existent material, which he created out of nothing, God does then fashion, because what does he say to the waters? Let the waters bring forth. Right? And he calls, let the dry land appear. So God is creating dry land, but he's also fashioning it out of something that he has already made. Similar, of course, to the making of man. Right? God didn't say, let there be man. We're told that God fashioned man, a body, out of what? Pre-existent material. Not that existed eternally, but matter he made out of nothing. Fashioned man and then breathed into him the breath of life. So that's the distinction that he's making. Uh, 2A there in your notes, creation is the work of the one and only living and true God. This, of course, is one of the peculiar glories and proofs of God's deity to the exclusion of all other gods and as idols of men's imagination. Turn to Isaiah 37. We've come across these verses several times in other studies. This is the way by which the Lord is distinguished in Israel, and indeed in all the world, that he made the heavens and the earth. Isaiah 37, verse 16 O Lord, God of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, for you have made heaven and earth. His grand distinction as being the only true and living God. Turn further to Isaiah 42. Verse 5, thus says the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. Indeed, he gives breath to every living thing, says the psalmist. 44, 24, we'll just run through these very quickly. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb, I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. And then, of course, 45, verse 12. I made the earth and created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens, and I commanded all their host. Commanded all their host by calling them into being. Calling them into existence, let there be, and then separating and distinguishing one from another. So scripture teaches then that no part of creation is self-existent. Because everything that is was made by God. Look at Nehemiah 9.6. It's a wonderful verse to memorize with regard to God's providence. It's a wonderful proof text for God's providence over all things. But it also establishes the doctrine of creation. Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 6. You are the Lord, Yahweh. You alone, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. There's the doctrine of creation, everything. And you preserve all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. So that's a great verse to memorize for both the the works of creation and providence, which again, as we've said, is how God executes his decrees, right? So it's a wonderful text to post and remember. So creation, therefore, has a distinct existence, distinct apart from God. Its existence is derived right? Not eternal. Creation is not God. Creation is not any part of God. Contra, of course, in Latin means against, right? Contra distinction. Contra pantheism. Pantheism says that the creation is an emanation of God, that God is everything. God is everywhere. Yes, God is omnipresent. And God is in all things and through all things because he upholds all things. But God isn't the thing itself, Creation isn't God. It's not not an emanation of God. It's not an extension of God. 
It's a revelation of God, a declaration of who he is, enough to condemn sinners, yes, enough to preach repentance, but it is not divine in any way. We can cut down the trees and mill them for paper, right? We're not killing God. We're not destroying anything. God has given us the earth to use. Pantheism is false. So creation is not God or a part of God, but it's something absolutely distinct from God and created by him. There's another list of verses from Isaiah. Isaiah is great for this, right? Because Isaiah is countering, he's preaching against, and he's God's covenant lawyer, calling Israel out for their idolatry, and in part for the utter foolishness of it. You're going to cut down a tree, and you're going to use part of it to, to bake your bread, part of it to keep yourself warm, part of it to carve an idol and bow down to and say, you made me. I worship you, help me. It's foolish, says God. It's ludicrous. So Isaiah is filled with these kinds of texts. So it's something absolutely distinct from God, created by God, yet the world is ever dependent upon God. God stands above it as creator, and he stands within it, if you will, as provider and sustainer. Contra deism, right? A lot of our founding fathers were deist, right? God created the world, yes, but the idea of deism is that God created the world and kind of set it in its natural motions, the laws of physics, the laws of nature. Things are just rolling on. Where it goes and how it unfolds is sort of this machine. You push play and you walk away. No, instead, contra deism, the Lord sustains and upholds. We've read already that God gives the breath of life. He gives spirit to all his creatures. If God were to withdraw that, we would cease to exist. Not only would we die, we would cease to exist. God upholds. All things. Look at Psalm 145, verse 15. <clears throat> the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. If the Lord withdraws his hand, we die. We cease to exist. We cannot continue. Our heart does not beat on its own, though we think it does. The Lord sustains everything. So we do not affirm deism. We affirm the theology of the scripture, the creation and the providence of God. Creation is attributed uh, by scripture to all the persons of the Trinity, of course, to God, absolutely. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, but also to the Father, to the Father through the Son, to the Father through the Spirit, to the Son, I think the, the Word became flesh in that text, right? In the beginning was the Word. Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were made by Him. And then nothing that is or was made that was not made by Him. And to the Spirit, of course, as well. We see in Genesis 1-2 where the Spirit hovers over the waters, ready to execute the divine will. So that when God says, let there be, and He begins to call things forth and separate and sink, it's the Spirit who exercises that execution on behalf of the Godhead. Turn to Job 26. <clears throat> Job 26, verse 13. By his wind the heavens were made fair. By his hand, his hand pierced the fleeing serpent. That idea of wind at Ruach in the Hebrew is the same word for spirit. Right? The wind, the breath, the spirit of God made the heavens fair. Job 33, we'll get into the Elihu's speech. Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. And that's true for everything. Right? The Spirit of God brought everything forth and gives life to all things. And, of course, in Isaiah 40, once again. However, a couple of distinctions here. Again, we have to, we speak of, we have to speak of God anthropomorphically, Right? fashioned after man, after our body parts, after our actions, our thinking. We have to speak of God in a way that makes sense to us. And the only thing that makes sense to us are human terms and human actions, right? And human existence, in fact. So we can't speak of God in any other way. We don't have the language, right, to wrap our minds around the infinite, incomprehensible, eternal deity. And so God, God allows us to speak of him after the fashion of men, because he speaks to us of himself after the fashion of men. It's what Calvin called baby talk, right? He lisps to us. And so we can speak of God in a way, and we can speak of creation as being attributed to God, but also to the Father and to the Son and to the Spirit with these distinctions, 
But it's important that we understand that it's still God working harmoniously and as one. And so a couple of quotes here are helpful. One from Shaw, one from Burkhoff. Shaw says, we must not therefore suppose <clears throat> that in creation the Father is the principal agent and the Son and the Holy Ghost are inferior agents or mere instruments. In all external works of deity, all the ad extra works, all the works outside of God, you remember, each of the persons of the Godhead equally concur. Very, very important. The Son isn't less. We don't have subordination within the Trinity. We don't have the Father delegating and ordering around. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and then we hear the Lord say, let there be, and then John says in the beginning was the Word. And we see the Spirit hovering, hovering over the waters, and then we see the Spirit hovering over Israel. We see the Spirit changing hearts and is the only one who can regenerate and make us new creatures. We see the power of the Spirit and the, the right arm of God and the breath of God and the Word of God, all of these things. There's a way in which we can understand and speak of God, but we must not separate. Remember, God can't be separated in a way that He does this. The Father does just this, and the Son does just this, and the Spirit does just this. We need to avoid that kind of thinking. And so Burkhoff's quote next is helpful. The second and the third persons of the Trinity are not dependent powers or mere intermediaries, but independent authors with the Father. The work was not divided among the three persons, but the whole work, though from different aspects, is ascribed to each one of the persons. All things are at once out of the Father, through the Son, and in the Holy Spirit. Those prepositions fill Scripture, and they help us to make some distinction as far as understanding. So there's the difference between the essence of God, in which He is all one, and He does all things as one, and then the economy of God, that is how God works. And He reveals His working in a way in which all things are from the Father, through the Son, and by the Spirit. And again, we're, we're kind of left there. We can't really go any further with that because we are dealing with things that are far beyond our comprehension. So we take God at his word, and we bow to Scripture. But it's helpful the Lord is you, that the Lord uses our language in a way that gives us some sense of his greatness. Those who reject the biblical view of creation resort to one of three theories to explain the world, and there may be others, of course, but these are the three main ones. On the one hand, they say matter is eternal, so that in the beginning there was God and matter, and then God just took matter and fashioned it. That matter has always been there. That's false. That God and the world are essentially one. That's pantheism. That's false. It's clear that creation is an act of God outside of God. And, of course, God can't create himself. God can't extend in these ways. And evolution, of course. There's a great quote by Meredith Klein. He says, The creation week was a definite closed period of time within which God created and produced all the significant varieties of life forms that he desired. There is no cosmic principle of evolution at work on its own outside the bounds of the creation week producing new kinds. It's a really great quote, I think. Helps us get at evolution. All right. I know I rushed through that kind of quickly, laid some text out for us to consider. Let me walk through the answer with you. <clears throat> the work of creation is God's making all things out of nothing by the word of his power in the space of six days and all, all very good. Four parts to this answer. Right? So given the different views of creation which fall within the boundaries of orthodoxy, even in our own denominations, we'll look at in a moment, the catechism answer helpfully affirms a fourfold view of creation that's required for a biblical view of creation. So let's break these parts down. And much more time could be spent on this. First of all, of course, the work of creation is God's making all things of nothing. I remember from R.C. Sproul's talks early in, in earlier days, he would speak about this matter. He said, the most fundamental maxim of all reason, science, and philosophy is that out of nothing, nothing comes. If there was ever a time when there was nothing, then there couldn't possibly be something now. Because out of nothing, nothing comes. Right? Which leaves us with only one option. There has to have always been something. 
something that had the very power of being within itself to create all that now is, all that now exists. There's nothing more elementary than that truth because out of nothing, nothing comes. That's a truth. It's a fact. It's a given. So there had to have always been something in order for there to be something now. Something then that had the power and the being to create that which is. And according to Genesis 1.1 and Nehemiah 9.6, which we've looked at, that something is God. In fact, someone, a person, the triune God. So when the Catechism answer begins with making all things of nothing, this out of nothing, ex nihilo, is vital. This is a vital part of the definition. It's a vital part of the answer. Right? It's necessary to understand this and define the creative act of God. And this phrase, out of nothing, is directed against those who argue, as we saw already, that matter is eternal or that matter is a divine extension of God's own essence, right? So the eternal, matter being eternal, or pantheism. Creation out of nothing. Where do we get that? Well, it's actually not in the Bible. That phrase is not in the Bible. Instead, it's in the Apocrypha. It's in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, verse 28. But the reason we employ it is because it really beautifully and perfectly captures exactly what the Bible teaches. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing before God. In the beginning, God. So we have, we have Genesis, we have Psalm 148, Romans 4, 7. Let's look over to uh, Hebrews 11, 1 to 3. We'll put that text on the table. Hebrews 11, 1 to 3. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. And then the rest of the chapter is the proof of that. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Very clear. What is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Why? Because what is seen was made out of nothing. Called into existence by the very word of God. Thomas Goodwin has a great treatise on the creatures of the earth, and uh, Alexander White likes to draw from Goodwin quite a bit, and so in White's book, he has this quote from Goodwin, not so much as a first matter was existing to his hands, not so much as a single atom, not so much as a single piece or entity of matter was existing to the hands of God in the beginning. All things were once nothing. The whole creation is built upon a quagmire of nothing. And is continually ready to sink into it and to be swallowed up by it. Were it not, as we've seen tonight, Nehemiah 9 verse 6, were it not sustained and upheld by its creator. The, sur the, the earth and the universe are not self-existent. We can't carry on. God could not, this is why deism is so foolish. God could not withdraw from his creation and let it roll forth like a ball rolling across the yard. God has to continue the life that he's given. He has to sustain the life that he's given. God upholds all things. God created the world, we're told in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. How do we read that phrase? Well, it means at the beginning of all temporal things. God created the heaven and the earth. When were they created? At the beginning. At the beginning of all temporal things, at the beginning of history, human history, at the beginning of time. Time is a construct of creation. There was no time, right? And so when we, when we talk about you know, in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, you know, God created the world in the beginning. Back of that beginning lies a timeless eternity. There was a time, an unbounded eternity, when creation was not and God existed alone. Turn to Psalm 90. I quoted it earlier, at least half of the verse. Psalm 90, verse 1 and 2. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Verse 2, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. God is. Isn't this the name of God? Whom shall I say sent me? I am. I am has sent you. 
And of course, John 17 in the high priestly prayer, what does Christ pray in verse 5 and verse 24? Father, give me the glory that was mine before the world began. Right? And after this world is ended and over, I want them to be with me to see my glory. The glory that I had before the world began. As what? The eternal God. The eternal second person of the Trinity. The eternal Son of God, the only begotten. Now, the angels, of course, always a big question. When were the angels created? Well, we know, obviously, being creatures, they would have been created during the week of creation as a part of creation. It's the only place it could have been created, right? However, the Bible is silent as to on what day they were created. But what we do know is, first of all, they rejoiced in the creation of God. Turn to Job 38. Job 38, verses 4 to 7. This is in the Lord's answer to Job. Where were you, right? Verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Sons of God is a phrase often used in Scripture to refer to the angels. In either case, referred to those clearly who shouted for joy when God stretched everything out. Right? So we don't know when they were created, but we know that they rejoiced in God's creation. Secondly, we know that the fall of Satan and his cohorts happened before the fall of Adam. That's clear. Right? Jesus says he's, he's the father of lies. He was a murderer, John 8, 44, a murderer from the beginning. And Revelation 12, 7 to 9 speaks, of course, of the devil being the dragon, being cast out of the heavens and down to the earth. Ben Maastricht has this great quote, very simple. It's certain that they, that is the angels, it's certain that they were not created before the first day of creation, since before that there was nothing but eternity. And it is equally certain that they were not created after man whom they seduced. So they're created within that week of creation. At some point, God made the angels. They rejoiced in his creation. They fell, that is, those who did fall. And then, of course, became the seducer, the deceiver, the tempter in the garden. So God made all things out of nothing. The work of creation is God's making all things of nothing. Second, Part of the view, fourfold view of creation is by the word of his power. We could spend a lot of time here. I hope that this will give you a lot to think about. This is a very important, very important part of the answer. By the word of his power. Creation was the result of God's creative power. Turn to Psalm 33. This is really one of the key texts, 33 verse 6. So you'll want to mark this and memorize it. <clears throat> Psalm 33 verses 6 to 9. By the word of the Lord... The heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. Think of Genesis 1. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. What a great text. 6 to 9, what a great text to memorize. And again, obviously, as we said earlier, it's anthropomorphic speech. God doesn't have a mouth. Right? But we speak of God. He speaks of his own mouth in a way that we can understand that he is a God who speaks. Because we know what the mouth is for. It is for speaking. He commanded and it stood firm. So, creation was the result of a word of God's creative power. He spoke and it came to be. Because with God, speaking and doing are the same thing. This takes us back to one of my favorite texts, Numbers 23, 19, right? The Lord is not a man that he should repent, nor the son of man, or that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Because saying and doing are the same with God. God doesn't toss something out there for a reaction. God doesn't toss something out there with a hope or on a whim. God says what he's going to do. And all you see this throughout the prophets. Have I not spoken? Have I not said it? Did I not say? And of course, the great prophet signature, the, the prophetic signature, right? Thus says the Lord. 
That was the guarantee that what they were saying was from the Lord. But more than that, it's the guarantee that whatever they said is, ex is exactly how it's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. Why? Thus says the Lord. That's it. We don't need any more than that. There's no more proof needed. Because if God said it, he will do it. See, speaking and doing are the same thing with God. So contra the evolution of species, God created everything according to its kind. Let's go to Genesis 1. You're thinking, wow, it's about time. I don't know how long before we get to Genesis. Genesis 1, verse 11, 22 and 28. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. Verse 22. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth, giving man dominion over all. So contrary to the evolution of species, God created everything according to its kind. God created everything with maturity, with age. The sun's light already on the earth. Trees already mature with fruit. Animals and human beings mature with eggs. God created everything with age so that it could immediately begin being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth. God didn't create infants. God created a man and a woman. God created mature trees with fruit ready to drop seed and produce. But look at number two. Two and three are very important. The catechism says, by the word of his power, he brought forth all things out of nothing. But more than simply the creation of the visible and invisible universe is meant here. God names as he creates. Genesis 1. Verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Verse 10, God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together he called seas. Verse 11, and God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation, plants, fruit, each according to their kind. God is naming. Verse 14, same thing. Let there be lights. Let them be for lights upon the earth. In the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth, and it was so. Let them be for signs and seasons, for days, years. God is naming. Verse 20. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth. Verse 24. Let the earth bring forth living creatures, livestock, and creeping things, and beasts. And, of course, verse 26, let us make man. Verse 27, male and female, he created them. God is naming as he creates. Don't miss this. This is important because it gives both existence and meaning together. When God creates, he gives something existence. When he names it, he gives it meaning. Existence and meaning are not separated, they're joined. God creates and he names. This means every part of the world comes into existence fully interpreted by its all-wise creator. Just value that for a moment. Everything God made, he named, and in naming it, he's interpreting it. He's giving it distinction, he's giving it purpose of life. He's giving it its place in his world, where it will be most happy and bring him the most glory. Right? Contra the identity crisis and man's search for meaning in the universe, there are no brute, uninterpreted facts for man to interpret and explain autonomously. This is very, very important. Right? Think of our identity crisis. How do I know I am who I am? How do, who am I? Who God made you to be. We're made male and female. All of the creation is named. We are named. Everything that God made. Genesis 1 to 3 are probably the most important texts in the whole Bible. 
because it's the beginnings. It's the origin, right? It's the owner's manual in a sense. If anything is wrong, we've got to go back here for the answer. Go back before the fall and then to the fall itself. We see the creation as God made it, and we see creation as man's sin, corrupted it and polluted it, right? Genesis 1 to 3 are very, very critical passages in the Bible. So what we find is that God has explained everything. God has interpreted everything. Nothing is given to us in creation for us to handle and decipher and decode and name. We don't name things. Because to name something is to show our dominion over it, and it is to give it purpose. Instead, God has named, he has distinguished, because he, the creator, alone knows that for which he made something, and, and in fact, what he made. And even in Genesis 2.23, when Adam says, Behold, flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone, she shall be called woman, and he names the woman, and later on, of course, naming her Eve after the fall, in faith, that God will indeed keep his word, but even when he names woman in verse 23, he does so before the fall, obviously, as an echo of God's naming of the woman in verse 22. What does verse 22 say? That God made the woman from the rib. In other words, God knew exactly what he made, whom he made, and he named what he made. Woman, that's who I made. And then Adam, when he saw her, did exactly what he would do as an unfallen, perfect creature. She shall be called woman. I see what you've done. And he echoes God as the vicegerent having dominion over all creation. God's naming things gives them meaning, gives them purpose. Number three, this means the beginning of wisdom for man. Think of Job 28, 38. The beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. Apply that text to this section. The beginning of wisdom for man, that is the way to have an accurate knowledge of the truth of anything and of the meaning of life and of all of creation, the way for man to have that knowledge is to fear the Lord. What does it mean to fear the Lord? It means to reverently and believingly and confessedly bow to the revelation of the name and meaning that he's already given to everything. The beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. Take God at his word. Cornelius Van Til, an old apologist at Westminster Seminary, described this as thinking God's thoughts after him. Van Til is the one who coined the phrase, there are no brute facts, that is, uninterpreted facts in the world. Even scientists and all their discovery don't come to something that is a brute, uninterpreted fact by its creator. They've discovered a fact that the creator has already interpreted, already named it, called it, and made it what it is. They can't change the meaning, change the make. They have to recognize what it is, what it does, describe it more than naming it. But in fact, it is God who gives all things their interpretation because he gives all things their existence. So think of this again with regard to ourselves. How do we know our place in life? How do we know who we are and the reason for life? Go back to the beginning. Who did God make me to be? And this takes us to our catechism question number one, right? The chief end of man. What is the, what is the catechism question number one getting at? What interpretation has God already given you? And that's where the catechism begins. Think God's thoughts after him with regard to yourself. You were not made for yourself. You were not made for your lust. You were not made for the world. You were made for God to glorify him, him and enjoy him forever. That's your purpose. Fear God by, a, by accepting that and living in light of that, and you'll be the happiest creature on earth. We could spend a lot of time there, but I hope you get where I'm going. All right, the third part of the definition. In the space of six days. Here the wording of the catechism, obviously taken from Genesis chapter 1. The catechism is being designed, being written to refute two errors. On the one hand, the error of evolution. And secondly, of course, which obviously Darwin was a lot later, but still, establishing a positive, creative act of God, the divine fiats that God said, let there be. That's what they are establishing. God created, period, out of nothing. So, contra evolution, contra, contra the eternal nature, or, or uh, eternal matter, or any of that, or pantheism, all of that is being refuted in that, uh, that part. But secondly, also the teaching of creation as a single instantaneous act. This was very popular by St. Augustine in the 4th century, and it gained a lot of ground. The idea was that God created everything instantaneously. At a, at a point in time, God made everything. Everything as it is, with its age, in all of its connections, boom. Of course, that's not what Scripture declares. Scripture declares a succession of events. 
each led by God doing something, saying something, right? Let there be, let there be, let there be. God is, God is in fact, carrying this out successively, progressively. It's not instantaneous. And so it was contra that. The teaching of Genesis 1 and 2, as you well know, is that God created all things in six, six distinct periods of time or days, and God rested on the seventh day. Let's go to Exodus 20, verse 11. It's part of our confession of the law of God, which will be before us this morning. <clears throat> Exodus 20, verse 11, in the fourth commandment, we are given this. For in six days, this is the ground, the basis for the fourth commandment. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. He set it apart. God set it apart. Therefore, you remember to keep it holy. Keep it set apart. Don't mingle it with the days of your week, the, the work days of your week. It is set apart by God. You can't change. Come back to what we just said. God names the seventh day, doesn't he? He names it. Right? He calls it the day of rest. And he, in Hebrew, the rest and Sabbath are the same word. Shabbat, our Sabbath, right? So God names the seventh day. You can't turn Sunday into a Friday. You can't turn Sunday into a Monday. You can't turn Sunday into a Saturday, right? As far as the Christian Sabbath, it is Sunday. It's the Lord's Day. He named it. You can't rename it. You can't make it what it isn't. It is what it is, and you'll do that. You'll bring him glory and find yourself the happiest thing on earth if you just do keep his naming, keep the meaning he's given to everything. So, in Exodus 20, 11, God himself declares to us that his creation week serves as the basis for both our timekeeping and our Sabbath keeping. That's what the fourth commandment declares here in Exodus 20, 11. God's creation week teaches us two things, more than two things, but relative to the fourth commandment, it teaches us two things, how to keep the time and how to regard the day he has set apart, to honor it as set apart, right? So what time are we keeping? Six and one, that's the time. We work six, rest one, work six, rest one, work six, rest one. That's how mankind lives. That's how we were always supposed to live. Read, the, read through the flood. And notice what's happening as Noah, as the days of the flood are unfolding and the birds are sent out. How long did Noah wait each time? Seven days. Why seven? Right? This is before the law. It's before all. But Noah is keeping time. But he's keeping the time the way his father and grandfather and great-grandfather, the way all of them have been taught to keep time by God. Six and one. Six and one. Time has always been counted by sevens. The seventh day changed, of course, from the Old Testament on a Saturday to New Testament on Sunday by virtue of Christ's resurrection. But we still keep time the same way. When we break that pattern, we're miserable. We drive ourselves into the ground working seven days a week. We drive our souls into the ground by not honoring and resting in Christ on the Lord's day. In the creation week, God is te teaching us how to keep time and how to keep the Sabbath, that the Sabbath is to be kept in the same way he did, by a holy resting, as our confession says a holy resting all that day. So in the creation week and alongside it, God created, God both created time and revealed to us how to keep it. When we follow God's pattern of timekeeping, when we, when we adopt that rhythm, we honor him. We glorify him. Man, unbelievers even glorify God by keeping that time. And they themselves are the better for it. But when we don't keep time as God has taught us to, we both rob him of his glory and we work counterproductively to our own good and happiness. It is not healthy, it is not wise, it is foolish, and it is sinful. The catechism intentionally here, not only in the catechism itself, but also in the confession, the catechism intentionally doesn't define the length of the days of creation. And if you've looked at Chad Vendixorn's book, he talks about this, as well as Sinclair Ferguson in the um, uh, talks he's done on the confession, the study he's done through the, the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Catechism intentionally does not define the length of the days as 24-hour days. It merely says, in six days, right? In the space of six days. The 24-hour thing that is so important for us today, so serious a discussion for us today, uh, with the introduction of so much more scientific discovery and so much more scientific garbage and lies, trying to rob God of his creative glory, glory as creator, um, it wasn't a significant issue for them. They weren't up against that question, right? Really, the two things they were up against was God creating or not, 
And then secondly, the Augustinian view of this God creating all things instantaneously. So, of course, they borrow the language, they take the language as they ought and must from Scripture itself. And what's important is what they affirm here. They affirm the progressive rather than the instantaneous nature of, cre of creation, as well as the fact that creation is the work of God. God made all things of nothing by the word of his power in the space of six days. So they're affirming a literal historical creation. It's not myth. Right? Think of all of the Babylonian, well, all of the false religions, all of the myths. Everybody has a creation story. Why? Because we all came from Babel, where the truth was. We all came from Noah, where the truth was, right? So, of course, every religion has a creation story. But they've all been twisted to suit man's own interest and desires. And it's all been a perversion and a twisting of the one true creation story. So it's countered against all myth. And what they affirm is the creation, the crea the creation story in Genesis is true. It happened at, at a point in history. God created all things. No one was there, but God was. Number four, and I'll just lay this out for you. We don't have time to go into it, and maybe you've already been aware of this. There has always been a lot of discussion in Christ's church about the length of the days, which is why I think it's important to recognize that the catechism merely says in the space of six and doesn't define the length of the day, because that has been an ongoing discussion for many, many years, obviously even back to Augustine, right? The 24-hour view is certainly the historical view. It's the most popular view. But three other views have been recognized by our denomination and by the PCA and by other denominations as well as being within the boundaries of confessional and biblical orthodoxy. Right? So to hold one of these views is not to be a heretic. To hold one of these views is not to be unorthodox. In fact, it's affirmed that to hold one of these views, one of these four views keeps you safely within the bounds of Westminster confessional um, theology orthodoxy, and of course, biblical orthodoxy. So the first view of the length of the day is, of course, it's 24-hour days. Secondly, the days are ages, are epochs of time, right? The day-age theory this has been called, right? We, that's very popular, especially among those with a more scientific mind because of geology and the study of the earth, and the study of the, of the age of things. That, you know, if you go through, if it's six 24-hour days and we go back in the years that's recorded in Scripture, the earth is only about 6,000 years old. You know, scientists and those who have a scientific mind and those who appreciate the study of, of geology and the Earth's structure and the Earth's age struggle with that. How, does, how, how do these two things coincide? How is there not a contradiction here? Is the Bible false? And so science would weigh heavily on this view, but that doesn't matter. I don't mean that in a bad way at all. The days are ages, are epochs of time instead of being 24 hours each. Secondly, the, the, the B and C, the Second and third here, uh, these last two views are very, very similar. The days are God's time, right? There was evening, there was morning the first day, there was evening, there was morning the second day. The days are God's time. In other words, God is keeping time, but he's keeping time for himself as God, because as God unfolds, there's no man, and until day four, there's no sun, by which time is universally kept. And so the days are God's time. Real time being kept by God as he unfolds the works of his creation. And they're analogous to our normal solar days, which is the only way we knew how to know how to keep time, other than the six in one rhythm. And so they're analogous to our days, what, which is to say that God is establishing not a pattern of hours, but God is establishing a pattern of rhythm, which again is what we do find in Scripture, especially with the creation, or excuse me, the flood narrative, which is so important because. That's as early back as we can get to where there's any sort, of, any sort of indication of time being kept. Noah keeps time by seven. That is uh, the days of the week, I mean. And then, of course, the fourth view or the third listed here as the other three options. The days are unknown periods of time. Again, God's time. And the days of the week, the creation week, is used as a literary framework used by God to teach Several things. First of all, the historical fact of creation. This really happened in history. The story of creation is not a myth. Secondly, the theological fact is being established of its origination, that creation originated with God as the creator. It really happened, and God did it. And thirdly, the practical fact of how to keep 
how God's creatures are to keep time, this six-in-one rhythm. We glorify him by keeping time as he has taught us. And therefore, you have Exodus 20, verse 11. The fourth part of the creation uh, answer here, the fourth uh, fourfold view, is all very good. And this also is very important. I feel like the second and the fourth parts of these are really, really important. Declaring that God made all things of nothing by the word of his power in the space of six days and all very good is contra Manichaeism, which, remember, Augustine was a Manichae back in his early days before he came to Christ. It's yin-yang, that there's an evil power and a good power, two equal powers in the universe, good and bad, good and evil. This affirms that all sin and all evil are the consequence of man's rebellious act and not a part of God's good creation. Right? Sin didn't exist in the beginning when God made all things very good, right? That's the key. In other words, sin is not God's fault. God made all things good. Because, you know, the, the whole problem of evil. How can there be a good God with all this evil in the world? Well, let's go back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and see where this evil came from. And let's particularly look at the end of Genesis 1, which in essence is the end of the creation week, the work, the work part of the week. And what does it say? And God saw everything and God said that it was all very good. Very good. And so you have that catechism answer here. And so in other words, sin is not God's fault. There's no manufacturer's flaw in man that resulted in man's fall or man's sinfulness. We'll look at next time how God created man. Right? In knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. Three important ways to understand the image of God in man. There's not a flaw in man that he's bound to fall because God did something wrong. No. All very good. Sin arose from the heart of God's moral creatures, first the angels and then man. A choice of free-willed creatures. Everything is good because it's created, impaired, and enabled to reproduce all according to its kind. This is contra macroevolution in which one species evolves into another, although there is a place for microevolution where a species adapts within itself. That's pretty obvious. But this is all contra, takes us back to the other, what we looked at earlier, right? This is also contra the identity crisis of our day in which a woman can be trapped in a man's body. And the marriage crisis of our day in which the body of a man or a woman can be sexually united to a body of the same sex. Where is all this coming from? It's coming from the evil heart of man. How do we know that's wrong? How do we know that is ludicrous? How do we know it's false? How do we know it's a perversion? Let's go back and see what God did. Everything made and named according to its kind to be fruitful and multiply within its kind, obviously. Everything was created in a male-female pair to be with and reproduce with its own kind. And when God did this and God saw this, he declared in Genesis 131 that it was all very good. According to Psalm 19, it was a perfect created reflection of his glory as creator. The questions are before you that you kind of provoke uh, some thought and stir up some discussion. Maybe you can use these for family worship this afternoon. I hope that they will be helpful to you. And I hope this is helpful as we go through this doctrine of creation. And Lord willing, we'll look at how did God create man next week. So what is the work of creation? The work of creation is God's making all things of nothing by the word of his power in the space of six days and all very good. The fourfold view of creation to keep a man within the, the boundaries of orthodoxy. Very important and helpful. All right, let's close in prayer. Lord, we stand in awe of you this morning as the creator of all things, indeed our creator. You are the one who called us into existence, who brought us forth, giving us life in our mother's womb. You are the one who caused us to be conceived and to be created in your image. Thank you, O oh God. And we thank you that more than that, Father, it pleased you also to cause us to be born again, to regenerate us, to make us new creatures in Christ. As Paul says, we are new creation. And we thank you, O oh Lord, that you have set upon us your seal, your emblem, your mark, and that we belong to you. Bless us, O oh God, as we seek to stand in awe of you as the creator of all, the sustainer of all, the giver of every good and perfect gift, and our Father above. We come to your house today to worship you as God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and we pray for your blessing and help as we do so.
Take this study to our hearts, O God, and continue to grow and strengthen us in our faith, which we affirm and testify to by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray.